What defines a man? Is it the way he dresses? Is it the way he treats his family? Maybe it's the way he runs his business. What does he care about? Indeed, there are many things that make up a man. What do others see in him? What does he see in himself? What does he see in others? What makes him special? What defines a man? Bill's story began on Booneville Road, near Sargo, in Davis County, Kentucky. He was born at home on July 16, 1924, to Martin Michael Kegel and Cecil Crabtree. Cecil lost her mother at the young age of six to tuberculosis, and her father was a tenant farmer. Martin and Cecil met each other in Sargo and fell in love quickly. They were second and third generation immigrant families from Germany and England. Their families were hard-working and honest people who moved to America in the mid-19th century for a better life. Martin came from a family of four boys and two girls and worked a 75-acre farm on Booneville Road. Bill was the oldest of six children, five boys and one girl. The family moved to Lee Sherm's farm in Davis County in 1927. The Sherm farm was on Big Ditch Road, which is named Carter Road today. Life was tough. Cows were milked by hand and production was made to fit the family. The goal of Bill's family was to own a farm with 50 to 100 acres. Land ownership was difficult, and being a tenant farmer meant that much of the sweat of your brow went to the landowner's pocket and not your own. The seeds of self-sufficiency were planted early in Bill Kegel's life. His father taught him when opportunity presents itself, you meet it head on and make the most of it. I grew and became stronger. My dad would let me plow with the team. My dad taught me to milk. We always had five to eight cows to milk by hand. This is how we made a living. We had about $20 a week income. Seeking an opportunity didn't always just apply to farm life. Bill recalled playing with a neighbor girl and seeing some already chewed gum stuck on the back of a chair at her house. Looked like a perfectly good piece of chewing gum, so I stuck it in my mouth and began to chew, which resulted in me getting a good skin when I got home to my mother. In 1929, Bill's father saw an opportunity to move the Kegel family to Glenville to work for a man named Green Crabtree, who needed workers for his three farms. Shortly after, in 1932, the height of the Great Depression swept across the land. Work was scarce and money was tight. The Kegel family grew a big garden and canned homegrown vegetables. They persevered. In 1937, the Kegel family was handed another opportunity when they moved to a bigger farm in the prime farmland town of Rome. Soon after they moved, the 1937 flood came along and dumped the highest amount of water ever recorded in Davis County. The Kegel farm at Rome was not bothered, but all the lower lands were affected. He moved to Sargo School when the family moved to Rome. It was a brand new building and replaced a one-room schoolhouse. Bill was a member of the first class to graduate from Sargo School. A simple childhood game taught him one of the fundamentals of life. Sometimes the winner takes all. We used to play marbles, draw a big bull ring and put the marbles in the center and knock marbles out of the ring. I was a good shot. I played for keeps. Some days I would come home with two pockets full of marbles. The move to Sargo would prove to be an important turning point in Bill's life. About a month after I started Sargo school, I saw the prettiest little girl I'd ever seen. She was in sixth grade. Not only was she high-spirited and beautiful black hair, but I knew if I could round her in, she was what I wanted. This high-spirited beauty was Carrie Lee Newman. Faith was always an important part of Bill's life, even as a boy. The family belonged to Pleasant Grove Baptist Church and attended every Sunday. I continued to see the pretty little girl at church parties and at church. I never lost interest. Bill was unaware of what the future would bring. One thing he knew for sure, his future would include Carrie Lee. High school was another major step in Bill's life. It was the biggest building I had ever been in. I began to take agriculture, which pleased me very much. 
We could take two calves and feed them about a year and show them in Orangeboro. After the show, we would take them to Lowell and show them again. The judge picked the top three calves and mine was number three. I was so proud. What an honor. Upon graduation from high school, Bill decided to attend Georgetown College, a Baptist school. He played basketball and waited tables while at school and worked as a janitor to pay his tuition. Bill pledged Kappa Alpha fraternity. As a fraternity member, he made new friends and learned how to dress, how to dance, and how to get involved in school activities. While Bill continued his growth as a young man with focus and fire, the world outside was experiencing a different kind of fire. On December 8, 1941, the day after Japanese forces attacked the American military base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, Franklin Roosevelt addressed Congress and asked for a declaration of war with Japan. Lives of Americans were forever altered, as young men were asked to travel across the world to defend their country. The war affected everyone. Many mothers and fathers lost their sons to war. Mothers would cry all the time. Girlfriends would cry. These were bad times. When I was senior in high school, President Roosevelt declared war on Japan and Germany. This was tragic, much more tragic than a young country boy realized. Carrie Lee, the little black-haired girl, would graduate from high school in 1944. She and I had many problems. She was spirited, pretty, and I had problems keeping up with her. She graduated in May and I went into the Marine Corps in June of 1944. At that time, Americans had just received word that three years of concerted war efforts had finally turned into what would be written in history books as D-Day. The ultimate goal was to drive the German military back to Berlin by opening a Western Front in Europe. Boarding a train and heading to San Diego, young Bill left home and his new fiance, Carrie Lee. Camp Pendleton became his new home, and his life was now about adapting to life in the military. We went in a station where they were issuing shoes, clothes, military essentials, rifles, canteens, and canteen cups. <laughs> they asked us if we were short of anything. I told them that I did not have a canteen cup. Their drill instructor got mad at me. Of all the Marines that come through this place, this dummy does not have his canteen cup. I can't believe this. I didn't think I had done anything wrong. But in this place, you didn't have to do anything wrong to catch heck. The young Kentucky boy soon discovered that this was the new way of life. Bill learned to drill. He walked 20 miles a day on blacktop. Being accustomed to waking up early on the farm, getting up before the trumpet blew was no problem. Bill learned that the Marine Corps liked farm boys because they knew how to work and take orders. He was reassigned to advanced training and trained 10 days on and two days off. He was trained on throwing live hand grenades, crawling under fire, staying up all night on ships in the ocean, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Bill was being trained for war. Before he knew it, he was on his way to Puvuvu in the Solomon Islands, northwest of Guadalcanal. After the U.S. captured Guadalcanal, they were able to use the airfield to bomb out Japanese strongholds on nearby islands. Puvuvu served as a temporary home to the U.S. 1st Marine Division. Bill Kegel was right in the middle of the action. On December the 15th, they announced that we were going overseas. We had 12 hours to get things in order. We loaded on an 18-wheeler and boarded ship, took off, and the seas were rough. 75% of the Marines and sailors were sick. This was an awful feeling. You don't care if you live or die. I was sick for three days. Life on a ship was long and hard. The name of the ship was General Brackenridge, held about 5,000 troops. We would go southeast and then northeast, zigzagging so that Japan would not be able to find us. It took 18 days to go from San Diego to Pavulu. Bill was stationed at the 7th Marine Headquarters. While on the island of Pavuvu, he underwent more advanced training, hiking and mortar training. He and the others slept on cots with mosquito nets. The heat would make you sick, and there was no relief. Soon, they were told to get ready to ship out. 
They were informed that they were going to hit Okinawa, an island about 7 miles wide and 24 miles long, located about 300 miles south of the Japanese mainland. They would need a big airstrip to bomb Japan close to the homeland. He was to be a part of the men who were given the charge to take the island from the Japanese. Easter morning, April 1st, 1945. When we arrived, I have never seen so many ships, thousands and thousands, battleships, carriers, destroyers, aircraft carriers, and many ships. This is one of the times in my life when I was afraid. Many airplanes were bombing the coastlines. The battleships were shelling the inland. Just like a game of marbles I played as a child, we were playing for keeps. Kamikaze planes attacked from all angles, diving at big ships. Each day the kamikazes would come. Some would get hit, but most were shot down. Bill and his fellow Marines were loaded on trucks and relieved the army in the south. Then were loaded on ships to secure the island of Kuishima. A steady stream of machine gun fire laced the blazing skies at each stop. The Japanese fought hard, but they were no match for Bill and his band of brothers. On August 6th, 1945, the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima. This was followed by another dropped on Nagasaki on August 9th. The effects were catastrophic, prompting Japan to surrender six days after the bombing of Nagasaki. Bill Kegel, like many others who were serving overseas at that time, was unaware of what had occurred. I don't think any of us realized that the atomic bomb had been dropped. We had no newspaper, no radio. Some of the guys would get world news magazines a month old. One night I'd just gone on post. We got the news that the war was over and that we were, had dropped a bomb in Japan mainland. By the time I got off the post, the celebration was over, and I missed the biggest news of my life. There was still yet another mission after the short-lived shot of news. They were told to get their sea bags packed because now they had to liberate the Chinese from Japan. It took 18 days for the company to get to China. They arrived in the dead of night in the northern city of Qinhuangtao, located about 20 miles from the Great Wall of China. The next morning as we got up, I saw China for the first time in my life. The people were very poor. They did not have homes in the country. So many things we took for granted in America, they did not have. Bill's heart was touched by the things he saw. There was no hospital and there were very few schools. A family of 10 lived in a 30-foot square hut with one fireplace that burned big grass from the country. All families slept in one bed wall to wall from youngest to oldest. Bill stated that he had never seen a society that was in bad of a condition than what he saw during his time in Qinhuang Tao. Having grown up on a farm, Bill sympathized with the plight of Chinese farmers, who had to get their produce to market on a train. It was dangerous, and men lost limbs trying to make ends meet. One day in July of 1946, Bill received news that he was going home. He went to Tencent, boarded a ship to America, and left behind a chapter in his life that he would not soon forget. Bill could not wait to get home to his family, and especially to Carrie Lee. We came back to beautiful San Diego, palm trees, cars, big buildings, beautiful Southern California. I was tempted to stay, but my sweetheart and the prettiest girl I'd ever seen was mine if she hadn't jumped the gun while I was gone. Bill made his way back to Owensboro and went searching for Carrie Lee. After a tearful reunion, Carrie accompanied Bill back to his home to see his family for the first time since his return from war. Bill was ready to begin a new phase in his life and took Carrie Lee as his bride on November 23, 1946 at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. The two spent their first night together as man and wife in Evansville. After their honeymoon, Bill wanted to go back to college, so he enrolled at Georgetown College again and Carrie kept her job. They saw each other every weekend and once again, the separation was hard on them. Having just one car and a five-hour road trip separating them, Bill decided to leave college and return home. 
In August of 2009, Bill would be awarded an honorary doctorate degree from Georgetown College, an experience he calls one of the most humbling and amazing of his life. Bill and Carrie Lee began being dairy farmers with three cows. The dairy provided the young couple's income. While Bill worked with his brothers to form Kegel Brothers Enterprises, Carrie worked as a nurse for Dr. W. L. Tyler and Dr. Lee Tyler for 25 years. It was a good life. In 1950, the U.S. was still recovering from the war. Fears of another depression were always lurking in the distance. Ever the optimist, Bill told Carrie he did not think there would be a depression, so they pressed forward. Soon, they moved up to 300 cows. The family business continued to grow. The Kegels raised more tobacco and grain and bought their first self-propelled combine. We began to be one of the biggest farm operations in the county. We had started to buy land, which was very cheap at the time. We established good reputation and we worked our hearts out. The year 1953 brought a happy change in the lives of Bill and Carrie Kegel with the birth of their first child, William Martin Kegel Jr. But his dad called him Rod. The 1950s were a happy time for the young family as the business continued to flourish and the young parents were thrilled with their new son. Another child was added to the family in 1955, with the birth of their daughter, Marcia, who looked just like her mother. Bill was thankful to have such a loving family, and he passed down the lessons of hard work, giving back to the community, and a love of God to Rod and Marcia. Kegel brothers continued to grow over the decades as they brought more land and bigger machines. They hired more people and took on more responsibility. There was nothing they couldn't do. They faced any problems with an open face and a will to move forward. One such problem that happened in 1988 was a series of three fires that struck barns, hay, tractors, and manure spreaders. One barn was destroyed due to scrap wood catching fire, while the other two fires were started by overheated haystacks that spontaneously combusted. Despite these and other challenges, the Kegel operations continued to function. I give my credit for my success to the Lord. He has guided me and kept me in line. I've been in some hard places in my life, but I didn't give in to temptation. It showed me how to be a leader. A leader has to be motivated, hard worker, and take nothing for granted. The Lord has a halo over the Kegel's head because we aren't that smart, but we were quite fortunate in the belief that we have. Bill had taken the time to learn about people of different faiths and denominations of faith, and has felt the need to reach out to bring people together. Bill was brought up Baptist, but two of his closest friends are his Catholic brothers, Charlie Kamoff and Bishop McCraith. Bridging the gap between Protestants and Catholics has been a life mission for Bill. He was on the board of trustees for both Brescia University and Georgetown College. Bill believes we are all trying to get to heaven, and that being together along the path is the most important thing for this unity. Throughout the course of his life, Bill Kegel has been a leader. Some of his accomplishments include an honorary doctorate from Georgetown College, man of the year in service to Kentucky agriculture, board member for Independence Bank, Owensboro Riverport Authority, Owensboro Botanical Garden, BB&T, and the Agricultural Advisory Board for the University of Kentucky and Western Kentucky University and as a graduate of Leadership Kentucky. Bill has been a member of Pleasant Grove Baptist Church for 80 years, where he serves as deacon and Sunday school superintendent. In 2002, Carrie Lee restored the one-room school that was replaced by Sargo School. It stands now at Panther Creek Park with a historic preservation marker and a plaque with her name. Bill served on the advisory board for Owensboro Mercy Health Systems, he is past chairman of the Kentucky State Fair Board. He is a Shriner, and he has served on the Governor's Council on Agriculture, and is past executive chairman of the Davis County Democratic Party. Bill has been a key player organizing, supporting, and contributing to the Democratic Party in Davis County. He helped his good friend, Wendell Ford, along his journey from governor to the Senate. He served 12 years as the executive chairman of the Democratic Party in Davis County, and is still a contributor to both the party and the needs of the agricultural community. He met with President Jimmy Carter to discuss the farm strike, 
representing then-Governor Julian Carroll. He has always protected the interests of the farmer. To say that Bill Kegel has made a difference in his community would be an understatement. Community involvement and leadership has been the hallmark of his life, and without his dedication to service and working for the generations of tomorrow, Davis County would be a different place. Today, Bill is enjoying his time with former high school mate and girlfriend, Marjorie Swope. He is enjoying watching his children become leaders and shakers in their community. He is enjoying watching his grandchildren and great-grandchildren grow up. And he continues to work in the fields and maintain a healthy, productive lifestyle. Bill's fondest wish for the future is that his children and grandchildren will build upon the legacy he has left behind. Today's generation has advantages that Bill's did not. But like many others, he worries about their ability to face challenges. But he does offer this advice. This is to young people who have their life in front of them. You have to be industrious, you have to be determined, you have to uh, take a lot of knocks, you have to have thick skin. And also, on, on top of that, if, if the Lord blesses you with ability and you're able to succeed, you should give some of that back to your community. That's very important that, that if, if Governor Carroll used to tell us, he says, look, you were educated in Kentucky, you made your money in Kentucky, now give something back to Kentucky. And I feel the same way about a, a local community, that you should give something back if the Lord has blessed you with abundance. And I, I assure you that you will be very proud of yourself when you get ready to die. What defines a man? Is it the way he dresses? Is it the way he treats his family? Maybe it's the way he runs his business. What does he care about? What do others see in him? What does he see in himself? What does he see in others? What makes him special? What defines a man? William Martin Kegel Sr. has lived the American dream. A World War II veteran, a lifelong farmer, a dedicated family man, a community leader, and a deacon. Bill has seized every opportunity that life has presented to him. Like many people of his generation, Bill Kegel was raised with the belief that coming to America was both a privilege and an honor, a promise for a better life. This belief would sustain him through difficult times, and he would live his life in a way that fulfilled that promise for his ancestors. Bill has lived his life the same way he played marbles as a child. He's been playing for keeps. Through his determination and his unyielding effort, his two pockets of marbles has grown into a humble kingdom of success. The boy that took the plow at an early age has taken his hard work, his God-given blessings, and has shown us all what it means to be an American man. The journey continues.